So, uh, the, my title, the title of my presentation today is Linux on ARM, is this the next big thing? Um, just a little bit of uh, a quick background about myself. My name is Jared Smith. Uh, those of you who have been in the scene in, in Utah here in, in, in open source probably have at least heard my name or seen, seen me pop up on mailing lists and those sorts of things. Um, I've been associated with the Open West uh, the conference here and, and the Utah Open Source Conference before that since the beginning. I think there's only been one year that I haven't spoken or given a keynote or, or been associated with the conference. Um, I live in Virginia, but I work for Bluehost here in, here in, uh, in Utah County. Anybody here heard of Bluehost? A few people. Anybody here work for Bluehost? Got four or five Bluehost people here. We're trying to do the whole sea of blue thing here, show that we're part of the community. So that's that's kind of fun. So Bluehost pays me to to do the best job in the world, and that is open source advocacy, open source outreach, to really give back to open source communities in meaningful ways. Um, one of the ways I do that is I go to conferences, I speak. I, I like to speak on a lot of different topics. Um, today I'm going to talk about hardware. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about software. Um, last year I talked about cloud computing and photography tools. And, you know, I like to mix it up a little bit. So um, thanks to Bluehost for helping sponsor the conference and for giving me an awesome job and these guys too. Um, so really what I want to do is, is talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of ARM, um, get people introduced to the, uh, to the ARM processors, why they're important, why you might want to use ARM processors, why they may just be the next big thing in Linux deployments. And then towards the end of my talk, I'll talk about looking into the future and what do I see um, as far as the future of Linux on ARM processors. And I wish it was just as easy as turning the little knob on the, on the binoculars there to you know, have a clear vision of what's going to happen in the future. But I think I've got a pretty good idea of what's going what's be, to be coming down the pike. So um, one other logistical thing before I get started here, um, this is where you are. This is a talk on ARM processors. Um, I love this photo that it has two feet in the picture because when you're coming to open source conferences like this, the rule of two feet applies. Who knows what the rule of two feet is? Nobody knows the rule of two feet. The rule of two feet is if you find this talk boring, if you're not getting thing, anything out of this talk, please stand up, walk out, and find another talk that is more interesting. Because I would rather have you do that than be this guy. Okay? So I'm not going to be offended if you stand up and walk out. I realize this topic isn't for everybody, but uh, use, use your two feet. Okay, so let's talk about what do you know about ARM processors? Absolutely, Absolutely nothing, right? Okay, let me, let me step back a, question, uh, a second and ask this question. What's the most popular PC you know, processor out there? Intel. Somebody says Intel. Who believes them? Somebody raised their hand. Okay, you get one follower. Did, nobody said Motorola? Find popular. Okay, sold, sold the most number of processors of that processor family. A PC or computer, you know, general general purpose computing device. Let's put it that way. ARM. So the, the, what typically comes to mind is, oh, I'm thinking of the Intel processors. They're very popular. Everybody's got one on the computer, right? But honestly, there have been more ARM processors sold out there than Intel processors. And I think it's only going to get worse for Intel. But what do I know? We'll talk a little bit about why I think that's the case. Um, anybody know the history of the ARM processor? A little bit. What do you know? Reduced, when it, reduced instruction set. Yep. It's faster. Yeah, it's a, a risk-based processor. Anybody know how it got started? Started in the UK by a company called Acorn, and they were trying to build a processor to work with the old BBC Micro computer. Long, long time ago, right? Back in the Commodore 64 days, those, those sorts of things. Back you know, when the earth was still cooling and dinosaurs still roamed the earth. Um, they built, this, they built this, this processor, and they called it the ARM processor. And they made a really, really interesting decision along the way as they started coming up with new generations of their processors. They decided that what they wanted to be in is in the design business and in, in designing processors. And that they had really no interest in actually doing the manufacturing. So what did they do? They started just licensing their designs to other companies, letting other companies do, do the manufacturing and the, and, the, and the physical production of the, of the processors. And you know, that's, that's been very successful. So if you go out today and try to buy an ARM processor, you're not going to buy just the processor. And you're certainly not going to buy it from ARM, because all ARM sells is just a license to their, to their designs. 
But what you do end up doing is, is buying a chip from another manufacturer who's taking, taken that design from ARM, incorporated it into their own chip, probably added on a lot of other um, pieces and parts to, 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 to the puzzle, and, and, and then moved it forward from there. So um, let me ask a couple other questions. Um, first of all, does anybody recognize what that device is in? in it's a Raspberry Pi. It's a Raspberry Pi. It's actually a pre-production model of the Raspberry Pi, but uh, it is a Raspberry Pi. So I think the Raspberry Pi has been interesting for the ARM community for a couple of different reasons. One is it, 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 you know, it kind of broke some barriers as far as just getting a, a, a small, very inexpensive device in people's hands that they can really play with and start um, doing some neat and interesting things for you know, either $25 or $35, which is you know, pretty darn reasonable. Um, the other thing is that it's helped people um, really understand that, that, that ARM processors aren't just about mobile devices, phones and tablets, but they're moving into general purpose PCs and we'll, as we'll talk about a little bit later into the server category, which I think is the more exciting place for them to be than in, on a $25 PC um, like a Raspberry Pi. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Why, why might somebody want to use an ARM processor? Why do um, mobile phone providers use ARM processors? Low power. Low power. Why does that matter? It's cooler. Yeah. Battery life better. Uh -huh. And I think the perfect example of this was earlier this morning as I was um, here and getting ready for the keynote and, and, and some of the things that I was doing. Um, I, had to, I, I, I found the perfect example of this and I am, I'm going to apologize up front. I, I took this photo with, the, the, with, with my camera in the bathroom. But isn't this the perfect example? If anybody used the restroom here, notice that there, there's two buttons. You know, one with the green button, you flush it, it's a little, yeah, just, just, just a little flush. And if you need the full flush, well, then you, know, you, you push the other button. Um, I think we all care about the environment to some degree. Um, you know, power costs money, power causes heat, and low power, especially for mobile devices, is very, very important. But you know, how about on the, service, on the server side? You know, we at Bluehost have a big uh, uh, data center down in Provo. How much power do you think we use? <laughs> we are Provo Power's biggest customer, <laughs> and you can imagine why. So do you think it matters on the, on the big scale as well and not just on, on a cell phone? Absolutely. Why else might somebody want to use an ARM processor versus a, say, an x86 type processor? Isn't it just physically smaller? Physically smaller? Yep. There's some green pieces of paper in my wallet here that might, uh, might help influence that decision too as well. It's, it's more a microcontroller, so you get more I.O. and more peripherals on the device versus a microprocessor, mm -hmm. which is not a microcontroller. Yep. Uh, we're paying about thirteen bucks per chip on our, on our devices. Mm -hmm. more so, so thirteen dollars per chip. Anybody go go out and buy and buy, buy and buy latest Intel latest generation Intel, Intel processors for thirteen dollars a piece. Oh, yeah. So, cost has something to do with it as well. Okay. So, a number of different reasons to use ARM processor. Now, how many people really understand why ARM is different on on more of a technical level? Probably a few of you in here that know a little bit more. Um, I want to dive into just a, a few more of the, the, the more technical pieces of this and how specifically getting Linux up and running on ARM processors has, has improved over the past uh, year or so. Um, but I, ha I have one more image that I found I have to show when we're talking about why you might want to use an ARM processor. Um, how many people here have, have switched out to compact fluorescent light bulbs in their house? Most everybody has at least a few, right? Um, in Australia, they did a big push um, to get everybody switched over to compact fluorescence and even banned the sale of incandescent light bulbs like this. So you can't buy incandescent light bulbs like this anymore. What you can buy is heat lamps. You can buy a 60 watt heat lamp that looks just like an old incandescent light bulb. Why? Because it gives off a lot of heat. It just you know, gives off light as a, as a byproduct, right? Um, that's kind of how I feel about uh, Intel processors these days. Uh, not, not to pick on Intel, but you know. They give off a lot of heat, and they do some processing as, a, as kind of a byproduct. But uh, but the ARM stuff really really excites me a little bit more. So let's uh, let's break things into some some kind of logical levels and talk about ARM from a, a couple of different standpoints. First of all, I want to talk about when you're talking about ARM, you're really talking about four things. Um, you're talking about the ARM processor design that ARM the company um, came up with. Then um, 
you, you can talk about an ARM core, which is typically taking that design, putting it in silicon, um, you know, building it, building it into a chip. And then typically the, 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 the chip manufacturer will add a bunch of other peripherals to that. They'll add USB controllers and they'll add GPIO and they'll add clocks and they'll add, you know, muxes and, and, and things like that. And they'll create what they call a system on a chip. So typically in, in the ARM world, you don't just buy a processor and plug it into another board. You know, you, you build a, you know, you buy a, a system on a chip and that's got your processor and a memory controller and, and a USB controller and, and, and some other things all built, all, all built together. And then last but not least, you take that board, you add some peripherals and some connectors to that, and you end up with a, you know, with an ARM board. So here's here's kind of a, a, a diagram. You start with ARM architecture, get to an ARM core system on a chip, and finally you've got a, a board. Um, another example of what you might have on a system on a chip. So on a system on a chip, you probably have that ARM core. You may have multiple ARM cores. Um, beyond that, you probably have some peripherals, whether those are, like I said, USB controllers, memory controllers. Um, clocks, um, GPIO, you know, things, things like that. Uh, you know, everything that you, need, that you might need built into that one single chip. And then you add that chip and some memory chips and maybe a USB, con you know, a USB port and a power adapter and everything onto the board. And then, then you have an iron powered board. Okay. And so I've got a couple, a couple examples here of a couple of ARM devices, some that I've been playing with lately. Um, this is a little Marvell device called the Mirabox. It's got uh, a dual core ARM processor on here, um, two gigabit Ethernet ports, two USB 3 ports, and nice little lightweight thing. Pulls about, I think this one pulls between five and six watts of power. If I wanted to, I could probably run it on, on, on a couple of the AA batteries for at least for half an hour or an hour. Um, very, very powerful little machine, but, you know, very, very... Very cool, and you know, doesn't take much um, power at all. Doesn't need a, a fan or heat sink or anything. You know, it's a, a great little device. And then I've got an example of a little more powerful device. Um, this has got four Ethernet ports. Uh, again, dual core processor. This has got four gigs of RAM. It's also got a little SSD in here. Uh, I use this. I carry this around in my bag when I travel. This is my server for development and whatnot when I'm on the road. Um, but these are both built up. You know, somebody's taking taking the, the ARM core. Um, a company called Marvell has then taken that and built a system on a chip, and then these two manufacturers have taken that system on a chip, put it put it on a board that they bottle up in this in these packages. That makes sense. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, next thing we want to talk about is different generations of the ARM processors have had um, something we call soft software floating point and hardware floating point. So there are different ways of doing floating point mathematical calculations. And when I talk about floating point, I'm talking about uh, calculations with, with numbers that aren't just integer numbers, whole numbers. When you want to do, you multiply you know, 1.34 times pi, um, you, need, you need to do that either in software or some of the newer generations of ARM processors have hardware built into the processor to do those sorts of calculations. Um, some of the older ARM processors didn't have that hardware in the in the design, and so you had to emulate all that in, in software. So it slowed down their, their processing of, you know, of, of floating point numbers a little bit. Um, and so there's really two different um, major divisions in the, in the ARM family. Everything up to what's called an ARM v6 um, does, not have, uh, does not have hardware floating point on the design. ARM v7 and newer um, does have hardware floating point on there. There's also some additional extensions if you want to dive into the details. Um, you know how like on, on the x86 side you have like your MMX extensions and your SSE extensions and SSE2 and those sorts of things. There's a number of extensions like that in the ARM world. Um, things like the thumb extensions that, that do those, you know, those similar things. Extended um, ARM you know, processor instructions that, that handle certain math complications and those sorts of things. So um, without getting too much, you know, too deep into it, just know that um, there are certain things that have software floating point Newer, newer ARM processors do have hardware floating point in the, right in the chip. Um, the Raspberry Pi, for example, is an ARM v6 device, so it does have a, it does have a hardware floating point on there, whereas the ARM v5 and earlier chips don't, don't have hardware floating point. So uh, on this next slide, I've got uh, just a few examples of, of some of the different architectures that have, you know, 
that have been dealt. So here there's ARMv6 and ARMv7, which are two of the, two of the more new um, designs out there. Um, take, each of these take a different R, um, CPU core, took that, that design from ARM, built it onto a kind of an ARM core, um, and then somebody else came along and built a system on a chip. And then, uh, so for example, Broadcom came along and took, you know, took, took that CPU core, the ARMv6 thing, built it into a system on a chip, and then, and then a company came, comes along and builds the Raspberry Pi on it. Um, on the ARMv7 um, architecture, just for a couple of examples, um, you know, TI took that and, and created a, a little development board called the BeagleBone. Um, you know, there's an ARM Cortex A5 that uh, Samsung took. They, they built their own system on a chip, and they have a, a development board called the Arndale, which is a great little board. Um, Mar a company called Marvell took that same design, created a system on a chip called the Armada XP, and they created this open blocks blocks that I'm using here. Uh, this other platform also uses the Marvell same same system on a chip. So um, again, just different manufacturing, different manufacturers taking the same core you know, set of instructions, the same processor design and integrating it with different peripherals, different ideas, you know. This one's only got USB 2, this one's got USB 3, this one has eSATA and mini PCI, this one, this one doesn't. Um, just, you know, so you can kind of mix and match and find, find a design that works really well for what you're trying to do, depending on whether you're trying to do mobile or you're trying to do low-cost servers or, or that sort of thing. Okay? Question? What's the uh, ballpark cost for those? Um, I think I paid about a hundred and ten dollars, hundred twenty dollars for this little uh, mirror box server. Um, you yeah, know, great little device, very thin, light, lightweight. Um, this um, Open Blocks AX3 uh, thing is a little more pricey. I think this was more in the three to four hundred dollar range. Um, these aren't highly available in the United States yet. The company that builds these is actually out of Japan, and they haven't found a good distributor in the U.S. Um, but like I said, it, this, it's got a, an SSD in it. It's a little more, you know, beefy. It's got four, four Ethernet ports. Um, a little different design on it as well. So, and this is, like I said, it's got four gigs of RAM in it too. So it's nice, and, nice and beefy. Um, but again, you, you can have everything from a thirty-five dollar, you know, Raspberry Pi all the way up to you know spending you know, hundreds of dollars on a, on a system. Just again, depending on what your needs are, and that sort of thing. But most of the most of the devices tend to be, you know, cheaper than their x86 counterparts by by quite a bit. So I want to talk a little bit about Linux on the on the ARM processors. Now that we've kind of given you a background of the ARM processors in general, the hardware itself, let's talk a little little bit about getting Linux on ARM processors. Now Linux has run on ARM processors for a long time, but it hasn't always been smooth. Anybody here have experience using ARM, you know, Linux on ARM processors before before 2012? Few? How was it? Oh, it's miserable. I think Linus Torvald said it the best. And since I'm in Utah, I won't actually say what he said. Um, something about file system checking pain in the butt. <laughs> okay? It was a mess. Why was it a mess? Those of you who raised your hand earlier and have experience with this, you probably know it better than I do. Why was it a mess? You couldn't even get the compiler to work. For you couldn't time. even get the compiler to work. Or you had to use a special cross-compiler that was different than the compiler that you were used to. Um, other problems that we've had. Have, have vendors always uh, played nicely and made their drivers open source no. and explained how their platform works so people can write drivers and, and those sorts of things? No. There's still those companies that don't do that still. There's still companies that don't do that still, <clears throat> Marvell. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you know, so so you know, we're still playing some of those games. I think we're we're mostly past that in the x86 world. Most vendors sort of kind of play nice and give you at least base reference. You know, this is how my my product works. So yeah, you can go write an open source driver. They don't always open source their, their own drivers, but at least they give you enough information that for the most part you can you typically write an open source driver. This hasn't always been the case with ARM. Now I've seen a huge tremendous difference in the last two years, basically since, since Linus gave this quote in March of 2011, on support for ARM devices in the Linux kernel. If you look at the changes that are happening in the Linux kernel, and there's a lot of changes all the time, right? It's kind of like drinking from the fire hose. A large percentage of those are focused on ARM processors. So I want to talk about some of the things that have happened in 
in this space to really push that forward and help that uh, to be better. First of all is how the organization works for the people who are actually doing the work. The, 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 you know, Linus Torvalds doesn't do all the work on the Linux kernel, right? He's got you know, lieutenants and, and, and you know, component maintainers and sub-maintainers and those sorts of things, right? That's been reorganized in the last couple of years. Where, um, oh, what's his name? Russell. Um, Russell King isn't doing everything with, with ARM and not everything is going through him, but, but he's kind of channeling things and saying, hey, we're going to all get together and instead of this ARM team over here doing this, this piece and this ARM team over here doing this piece and we're not communicating and trying to do things in a common fashion, um, that's been reorganized so that there's one ARM tree and try to make things as generic as possible, work together with different, you know, different hardware from different vendors and then split out specific drivers and specific files when they're needed. But that way, you know, 90% of this box is the same as 90% of this box. They should be using 90% of the same code, right? That wasn't the case two years ago. It was probably that this, this, this you know, box and this box were sharing maybe 10% of the code. So that's how much it's changed in the past two years. Um, there's been a few other things that have changed um, with the way that uh, device drivers get, uh, get checked into the, to the Linux kernel and, and, and some of those things as well. Um, Probably the second major change is that it used to be that if you wanted to run this box and you wanted to run this box, you would have to compile different kernels for them, which is kind of a pain in the butt, right? Um, so they've really pushed hard in the last couple of years on making a what they call a multi-platform kernel, a kernel that will run on that box and will run on that box, and oh yeah, it's going to run on the Raspberry Pi too. Okay, how do you do that? If this has got different dist different components, different it's put together differently, how do you make that work? You statically compile it, all of the stuff you might need into one generic master kernel. That's that's, huge. that's one way of doing it, but or, it ends up to be a, a huge yeah. blob. Or, so one of the things that they've done to try to make that easier is they've they've come up with something called device tree. Anybody know what the device tree is? You're nodding your head. Tell us a little bit about device tree. What do you know? You didn't know you were going to be giving this presentation, did you? I didn't know it was going to be here. Um, I've heard a little bit about it. Um, not enough to really give a good explanation. But device tree is basically, it starts you out and basically it's a Q&A where you tell it what you're doing and it builds the kernel with you. Pretty close, yep. So, so the idea is that typically with these ARM systems on a chip, there's no way to go out and, qu and, and query it and say, hey, your system on a chip, what processor do you have, what other peripherals do you have, what memory controller do you have, what clocks do you have, what pins are you using for GPIO and other things. There's no way to go out and enumerate this stuff automatically. So there's no way for the kernel to know, oh, I've got this memory controller, or I've got this memory controller. So the idea of a device tree is that you're going to run, all run the same kernel, but different devices are going to have a different device tree definition that basically says, I'm using this processor and I need this driver for this you know, for this USB controller, and I need you to load well, these clocks for you know, the, and, and and those sorts of things. So it's kind of like you're running the kernel, but then you have this other blob of data that describes this is the hardware and this is how the kernel interacts with it. And that way, different devices can share the same kernel, but then they've got this extra piece of information out there, you know, to, that, that, that explains the differences between this box and and, and this other box. Um, it is um, a, 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 a binary blob. Um, typically what you have is when you're compiling your kernel, you have a, a, a what's called a DTBI or DTI file, device tree, binary input. Um, and then that'll get compiled into a binary blob called a DTB file, a device tree blob. And typically there's a couple of different ways you can do that and use that. The old style was that you would just you know, put all your details into your kernel and you'd, you'd compile a kernel for that particular board. There's two different ways we can do it now. If you've got a, an ARM device that supports loading up a separate device tree file when you load your, your kernel image, then you say, hey, load this kernel image and oh, here's my device tree. Um, some of the older bootloaders on ARM don't support that and so what you do in the kernel is you actually append your device tree blob to the end of the kernel image and set a flag in the kernel that says, oh, there's this blob of data on the end. That's my device tree. That make sense? So that's really helped things from kind of a, 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 a just a logistic standpoint of building one kernel that can be used across multiple devices. Um, 
So, uh, you know, I, I, before coming to Bluehost, I was the Fedora project leader and came from the Fedora world. And when you're trying to build a Linux distribution and trying to make it run on as many platforms as you can, things like this really make a huge difference in, in the effort required to get you know, up and running on a, on a new platform. So that's, that, that's one pretty cool thing. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is pin control. Um, as somebody back there kindly pointed out earlier today, um, ARM processors tend to have be used a lot, a lot in microcontroller type applications where you have a lot of pins. You have a lot of typically GPIO pins and those sorts of things. And system on a chip designers love to take all those pins and use them for different things at different times. <laughs> and the, the people who, who, who know, you hear them laughing in the background because it's, it's almost the bane of our existence sometimes trying to get this, this all working. And a couple of years ago, it was nigh into impossible to get all this working because somebody may have GPIO here and it may be coming through a mock and oh, you've got a UART here and a SPI interface and an I squared C interface and oh, guess what? They're just using two pins. And so you have to learn how to control these MOXs and, 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 and figure out how to get the, the outputs that you want at the right times. It was a pain. I can't tell you how many years off the end of my life I've spent trying to get that to work and I haven't done that much of, of this. You know, those are, those are years I'll never get back. Um, so one of, the, one of the major improvements to the Linux kernel over the last couple of years is doing a much better job of being able to enumerate these pins, explain how to control the, the MUXs to get the outputs and the inputs that you want in and out of the system. Cool. Last but not least, um, clocks. Clocks are a pain in the butt. Anybody here did, did embedded systems design? How many clocks do you end up with? Too many, right? Sometimes you're lucky and you can get away with a, with a single clock, but you know, it's kind of like the old adage, if you have one clock, you know what time it is, and if you have two clocks, you don't, all right? So a lot of these different components need different clocking and different, you know, different controls for the clocking. And up until you know, really about the 3.5 kernel, some of the 3.6 kernel, clocks could be a pain. And so there's been a lot of effort in the last year or so to, to really redo the way we do clocks with, with in the Linux kernel on, uh, for these hardware devices and, and make that work better. So I think we're get, getting to a state where, where support in the Linux kernel for ARM processors is in a pretty good state. It's not perfect. Um, 3.8 was certainly a huge improvement over the 3.7 kernel. The 3.9 kernel adds a, a lot more stuff with specific drivers in device tree for, for a number of common um, things. Like for example, on this, on this open blocks box, um, up until the 3.9 kernel, the Ethernet driver was a custom kind of a hack job by Marvell that worked, but it wasn't great. Um, with 3.9 device tree support for the for the Ethernet controllers in there, so it works a lot better. Um, things like serial interfaces and, and, and those sorts of things tend to work a lot better um, with more recent kernel. But it is a work in progress. I'm guessing it's probably going to take us another six months to a year to really fully flesh out the device tree stuff, get most of the drivers converted over to it, and, and work in a really, really good fashion that way. Um, so what's, what's happening in the future? That's kind of where we are today, what we've done in the last year or two. Um, where are we going from here? What do you think is going to be the next big thing with ARM? According to you, Linux. What's that? I said according to you, Linux. Yeah. Somebody in the back has got, a, got yeah, an idea. I, mean, I think some people are going to definitely try and replace uh, their Xeon powered servers and data centers and run multi did, 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 did you see my slides? No, but it's the obvious next step. I think there's a better solution to be in that. So I'm of the opinion that, that, that yeah, this is interesting on the small, you know, small and mobile space, but it's really the, you know, the data center where we're going to get the most efficiencies out of this, the more I think we're going to see this move next. This is a, this is a, a server from a company called Calzea. Um, nice little 2U box there. Guess how many ARM processors it has in it. Keep going higher. 196 processors in a 2U case, and I think it pulls like 200 watts or 250 watts of power. You know, it's ridiculous. You know, you've got a bigger power supply in your in, in your computer under your desk than than, than than powers this thing. 196 cores, pretty darn cool. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, we've got one of these in Fedora, and this is what we use for our build system, and it works really well. Um, but there's one other thing that I think that, that that's going to mean that the next generation of these servers is even better, and that's that um, 
The next architecture for ARM is going to be a 64-bit architecture, whereas ARM up to this point has been 32-bit. And it's not just going to be, let's build on some 64-bit extensions to the, to the instruction set. It is reworking the instruction set from the beginning to be 64-bit all the way. It's the promise that Itanium was that Itanium was never able to deliver. And it'll be interesting to see how, it, if the ARM guys are able to pull it off. Is there any support in the ARM for virtualization? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. That's one, of their, that's one of their key reasons for doing that is they're going to go 64-bit. It's going to have all the virtualization extensions designed in and built from the beginning. Um, and you can, on the virtualization, you could then virtualize the 32-bit ARM if you wanted to run a bunch of 32-bit ARM virtual machines on a 64-bit processor. But it's not going to have the 32-bit instructions in there other, other than you know, through, through, through virtualized. Isn't that one of the big features of the 3.9 kernel was extended uh, virtualization support for mm -hmm. ARM? And, and it's really funny because there is no 64-bit ARM hardware. So how do we how do we even how do we, how do we even how do we even build stuff and make it work if the hardware isn't even available? Virtualize it. Yeah. Virtualize it. Do, do you remember back when I went back to the very beginning of my presentation and I said there's this company called ARM and they build this processor but they actually don't build it? What do they just do? Design. They just design it in software, right? Anybody here use Verilog? Any double E's in here? What do you think this processor is building? It's just a Verilog file. You know, it's just a bunch of traces in a, in a computer file. And so we actually have um, a virtual 64-bit ARM processor that we can use to get, you know, bootstrap the system, get the compilers up and running, compile all the other software to make it work. I've got it running on my laptop right now, sitting there in the background doing nothing right now. But uh, so yeah, it's, it's out there. It's available. The 3.9 kernel adds the virtualization support to that. So I could actually spin up virtual machines in my virtual 64-bit ARM <laughs> processor. And that gets kind of, you know, yeah, boxes inside boxes and the little Russian dolls stacked, stacked together. But, but absolutely, it works. And, and, you, and you can do all that. Pretty cool stuff, huh? So I think this is where, where things are really going to go. I think once you get the 64-bit um, ARM processors actually shipping in hardware and, and vendors building, building um, systems on a chip out of 64-bit stuff, I think you're going to see a, a much bigger push than you see today um, on, the, um, on the ARM in the data center space and, and, and rack servers. Um, you see large companies like Hewlett Packard and Dell and uh, obviously the Calzada folks and, and others making a huge push in this, gearing, gearing up for it even before the 64-bit you know, the, the hardware is available. Um, you'll see hardware start start becoming available probably in the next year, if if, if even that, maybe six months. I, I I don't have any inside information from ARM of when when that's going to be very. It's going to be soon, and and these server companies are definitely gearing up for that because they see efficiencies in the data center. Hey, if you can, you know, if you can replace three or four or five or ten rack mount servers with one of these and use you know half the power or a third the power or a quarter of the power, that's good. That's going to be huge. Yep. Less heat, less cooling, less power. Do it. Question over here. I guess uh, for a while I used to follow the NVIDIA CUDA for this mm -hmm. GPU and so on, and it seemed like you know they were doing some real interesting things there. I mean, mm -hmm. um, does does one outweigh the other? <laughs> they're 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 really different different applications. I mean, CUDA is really aimed at high performance. It's really aimed at the performance side, you know, high performance of, of really complex number crunching kind of stuff. The problem is, is as they, as they keep cranking that to be more and more performance, they're using more power and, and requiring more and more cooling. Where ARM has always taken the attitude of, we're not going to be as high performance, but we're not going to be using, you know, we're, we're the, the cooling and the, and the power requirements are going to be much, much, much lower. So it's kind of two, two different ends of that spectrum. Um, they're both doing interesting things. The CUDA is obviously more geared around the kind of number crunching you do for graphics processing or, you know, large mathematical calculations. These, this is more a general, general purpose computing type, type processor. Question in the back. I can't remember. I tried to find it just now, but I had a friend send me a, a link to uh, an FPGA that now has an arm on it. Mm -hmm. And so my question was, is like, why? 
it's it's like you're it's like you're putting two of the same thing together and saying Here, together have fun, have fun. And some some sometimes and again depending on the FPGA sometimes it's it's easier to offload. Okay, I want a general purpose operating system running over here on the ARM processor, and then I'm going to use specialty routines on the and the FPGA so that I I don't have to have a, a big huge FPGA to run an operating system and a custom application. It's just like use the ARM processor for the the general purpose operating system side of things and then use this FPGA for a more specific application. So my, my question then that is, do you see that that's like ARM sort of getting more for it even more into the embedded systems side of things? I mean, it, I think so. we already see them everywhere in handheld devices, but are we going to start seeing them in like replacing stuff in the cars? They already are. Oh, yeah. They already are. Absolutely. I'm, I'm in not that well. But <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, like we use, we use some older one power of stack on top of Linux thing and other mm -hmm. uh, off, off task things that we want that are heavy enough that it requires its own. And, and, and the same thing happens on cell phones. A lot of times you'll have an ARM processor or two for the operating system, whether you're running iOS or Android or, or some other operating system, Firefox OS. But then you'll also see a special core in there that's probably ARM as well used just for the radios and, and, and controlling the, you know, the, 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 the GSM or CDMA or LTE side of things, the wireless side of things, the wireless radio. So um, that's not uncommon at all to have you know, different cores soldered onto the same, you know, even sometimes even on the same silicon. Um, anybody heard of the big, big dot little, little dot big, big architecture where they, they'll actually take multiple ARM cores and several, some of them more power hungry and bigger and some smaller and they'll actually shift your load depending on okay oh I don't need to use much power right now there's nothing big going on I'll shift it onto a lower power processor and shut off the other cores and oh somebody started you know running the touch screen on the phone I better fire up the other cores and, and, and have more power available um, and be able to shift shift workloads around and that kind of stuff is really really cool that's a four barrel carburetor it's a four barrel <laughs> carburetor that's exactly <laughs> what it is it's like it's like that one car I had I'm, I'm not going to admit this publicly you know the one that the, the one cylinder didn't work half the time, you know. All right. Other questions, concerns, comments, complaints. So we were talking before about the extensions to the instruction set mm -hmm. and things. Um, in general, about how many instructions are there in an x86 architecture versus an ARM, and is that one of the reasons why it's so much? Oh, yes. Right. Well, that's a very so, general question. It's a very general question, and I'm going to give you a, a very general answer. But let me step back. Back when I when the Earth was still cooling and I was still in college, um, I took a bunch of classes up at Utah State on computer architecture and, and computer engineering, and we learned the basics of the x86 instruction set. And we had you know, two classes on you know, assembly language programming and then learning those instructions. I had another class that was. I think it was a year-long class. It was two semesters long on just on the MMX extensions and learning those. And then, they, then there came the SSE extensions and the SSE2 extensions. And the, you know, go into a Linux box here. Should, should we have fun? Sure. <laughs> Why not, right? Yeah. Nothing like a live demo to, 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 to liven things up. Okay, let's see if we can make this bigger so that you guys can see. You guys see that okay? Yep. Yeah. yeah. What happens if I say cat, proc, CPU, info? You get all the flags. You're going to get a bunch of flags and extensions and everything. So tell me, how many, uh, how many different extensions are there and how many, you know, how many different instructions are there on an x86 processor? Too many. More than uh, I can keep in my head. I mean, it's on the order of several hundred, isn't it? But the actual instructions it can do versus yes. what does a risk usually have? Is it in the same order? A, a, a manageable number. A rememberable number. Now, again, each 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 platform is a little bit different, but it's, you know, this is this is just a mess. No, I, don't really know that. I mean, how many people here know what? Name one instruction that's on the SSE 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 three extension set that's not in SSE two. I know what that BMX means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, to, to answer your number, there's probably. If I had to make a rough guess, maybe five to ten times as many instructions on x86 as there are in ARM. Maybe it may be even more dramatic than that. Um, the other difference is that, and again, depending on which ARM core you're looking at, ARM design, um, ARM designs tend to have more registers um, available for instructions and 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 
more general purpose registers and less, oh, you can use this register, but it's really used by the CPU for all these other things, you know, kind of things going on. So that, um, you know, from, from a programming standpoint, if you're an embedded guy, it's, it just makes more sense. It's, uh, it's a lot less complexity, um, a lot more streamlined, a lot, lot easier to, to do things on that, on that level. I'm just glad I don't have to stick my head in, you know, in this every day. It's, I'm glad I got out of that world, to be honest. Um, I'm good because a lot of this kind of went over my head, but um, can the ARM processors keep up with a lot of the bigger, like, Xeon and server level hardware that are being run in data centers right now? So right now, um, the, the top of the line, you know, ARM <coughs> processor is probably, I don't know, 50 to 60% of the processing power of uh, the top of the line Xeon processor, you know, rough apples to apples comparison. The difference is, is if you're looking at computing power per watt or computing power per dollar or both. So if you have one of these Calzada systems and you've got 196 cores and say, well, I could have four, four Xeon cores or I could have 12 ARM cores and, you know, you just throw more cores at it is the answer. Well, I think the whole Business, the whole niche that ARM is trying to fill there is they see all of these data centers with CPUs that are underexploited. They are completely using one or two of those uh, instruction sets where they're just serving up web pages and uh, providing a little bit of network traffic and having really nothing to do with the advanced capabilities that exist in the, the greater instruction set CPUs. And so they're exploiting the, the overpriced and underutilized CPU space. Thank you. I have another question. Sure. Um, the, the ARM architecture, from what I understand, has been around for a long time. Yes. Why do you think the, the market adoption has been so slow? Or why is it just now that like you think Linux has become more compatible or we're seeing I think I think it, I think it's a number of things. I think it's inv advancements in the ARM you know, processors and more power to the processors in general. I think it's the, the economies of scale that the price continues to drop, um, even though they're adding, and, and part of that is because they're shipping billions and billions and billions of processors every year in a very um, price conscious market um, so that they can get their economies of scale down. I think that the, 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 the Linux support getting better certainly has plays into that as well. Um, I, think it's, I think it's just kind of the perfect storm of everything really converging at the same time in the right place. So uh, just following on his question, but also getting a bit of advice from you. Um, if we really want to do what a lot of us are here for is learn how to take control of our devices, our information, making our ownership where we can control what we want to do, where do we go from here to learn more about ARM and how we can develop it more for ourselves? Um, the, the place where I learn most of my ARM stuff is hanging out in the ARM special interest group at Fedora. Um, and, and it's a group of, there's probably 30, 35 of us that hang out in an IRC channel and on a mailing list, and we're working on making sure Fedora works really, really well on ARM. Um, you can follow the, the you know, the, the ARM kernel mailing list. It's, again, sometimes it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose, and unless you have experience in, in, in Linux development, which I don't, it's, a lot of it just goes over your head. You pick up nuggets here and there, but from, from, from me learning, the, the easiest place was to do it in the, in the Fedora group that's working on ARM because I can look at, hey, we're trying to, we're trying to recompile this application to work and these are the problems we're running into. Um, learn about the different pieces of hardware and how to get them working, learning learn, learn those pieces. That's, that's where I learned this. Um, that's, that's probably the, the, the easiest way to get up and running. Certainly not the only way, but that's, that's, that's what works for me. Do you, I, I've seen some great computers where they do like X by X grid at risk and they use a small like asynchronous message passion to get to all the cores. Do you see ARM in the near future, in the, last, in the next like two years, actually putting ARM cores in there and doing like a grid, so like 10 by 10, so you get 100 cores on one die? Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, think, I, think, I think you'll move that direction. I mean, these Calzada systems, I can't remember what they have. I can't remember if it's... Well, there's a whole bunch of boards there, that's yeah. why I'm asking. Yeah, there's, so there's a bunch of boards, but each board has something like 24 cores on it or something like that. Yeah, but if you yeah. do the scaling, right. theoretically, you can... Yeah. Okay. I think, um, to follow up on that, I think that there was a Kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. to tool out something like that. Like that's the Parallela, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, now it's now this is a slightly different application because that's a, that's that's a, a system on a chip designed specifically for parallel computing rather than just general purpose yeah, computing. That's, but yes, that's my question is it's just yes, there's a there's a ninety nine dollar stick ninety nine dollar Kickstarter campaign to really kick that off. Do what the Raspberry Pi did for getting people more interested in in, in small personal applications with ARM processors. They're doing the same thing for for really parallel computing, getting people started and understanding. How, how to write software that works re really well in a parallel environment. Okay. So check it, check it out. The question I had when you started talking about the moving into the <coughs> data center, mm -hmm. um, I know it works great for Linux-based um, applications and things like that, but what about the, those that uh, want to virtualize some of the commercial, like uh, Windows? Or um, anybody heard of this thing called Windows RT? That's that's all ARM based. So yeah, uh, the, uh, the the commercial side of the house is 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 moving over to ARM. Um, some some kicking and screaming, and some more actively. I mean, there's a company named Apple. There's this company named ARM Apple stuff. that not only not only um, sells ARM ARM powered devices, shiny 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 expensive you know brushed aluminum, um, you know ARM powered devices, but they tend to gobble up ARM development companies that that take. Build the ARM core and build systems on a chip and, and those sorts of things as well. And they, they tend to be very, very heavily invested in, in ARM. There's other you know, commercial companies uh, tend to be you know, headquartered around Seattle somewhere and you know, have, have bosses that throw chairs. Um, they tend to be a little slower on the, on, the, on the ARM uptick. I mean, Windows RT, you know, they're, they're coming along with it, but it's not got any market penetration really. Um, they're trying to get into that market, but it's, you know, I think I, I think this whole movement to ARM really caught them a little unawares, and they're uh, I think they're they're running a little behind some of the other vendors in, in that regard. Well, the one that really surprised me is HP on the Moonshot project. Mm -hmm. I mean, their first server is going to be Intel Atom based, but they're they're actively working on an ARM based rack server now. But mm -hmm. that's that's quite a shift for Intel because they restricted them AMD off on mm -hmm. Intel Z on shop. Yep. Period. And and you look at Dell. I mean, Dell has been. You know, tied to basically tied to the hip, but you know, with Intel from the beginning, and and, and even even to the point where they, they offer very very few options, even with AMD processors, um, and and for them to say yes, we're going to do we're going to do servers built on ARM, and, and that's the way we're going to go, um, that's huge. Any, anybody catch the, the 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 announcement last week from AMD? They're talking about some of their new processors, and one of the slides was really interesting because they said, oh, this is one of our X series processors, meaning. There's going to be other processors that don't have an X. Maybe there'll be an A. It's going to be really, really interesting to, you know, to to, to see how that that, that and, and again, companies like Nvidia, they've they've, they've been on, on the ARM platform for quite a while. You know, they they build systems on a chip and, and everything. So you, you wouldn't be it wouldn't surprise me to see AMD move into the into the ARM market as well. And and a lot of a lot of big name players getting into the space. It's it's a fun time. AMD already announced that they're working on a design that actually embeds an, an ARM core on the same silicon as one of their Opteron systems yeah. and gets an additional functionality. I, I haven't seen it, but yeah, probably so. It wouldn't surprise me at all. It would not surprise me at all. I think I saw their stock was like three dollars and forty-four cents or so a day or two ago. It's as cheap as an ARM processor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did I go there? I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you know that, that that that's company company business, and you know sometimes companies do well and sometimes they don't, and it'll, it'll be interesting to see if that causes their stock price to go up. If they do it well, or if they do it and they flounder, it may cause their stock price to go down. I, you know, I'm I'm not an economist. I am just a geek, you know. So we all need to retire, though. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm hoping I can retire from the work I do in open source. So that's that, that, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Any other questions? We're just about out of time. Um, if you have other questions, um, come come up and grab me at the booth. If you want to check out these devices, um, um, feel free to come come take a look at them. I mean, I think I've even got power adapters and serial cables and network cables and switches and everything. We can fire them up and, and play with them if you're if you're really that interested. Come grab me. Um, again, um, I'm, I'm if you want to come hear my software talk tomorrow. Again, I'm talking doing a talk at uh, two o'clock tomorrow. I think it is uh, Drupal content management system. Um, come talk about that. But uh, Thanks, thanks for your participation. Thanks for your question and enjoy the rest of the conference.